<clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank you very much for assisting to this webinar that introduced our Master of Medical Humanities. For this occasion, we have the best lecture to explain us why the medical humanities are more important than ever. Uh, Jonathan McFarlane is the president of the Doctorate a Humanist, which is an international organization of students, scholars, educators, and practitioners dedicated to the study, preservation, and promotion of the humanities and humanism in medicine and healthcare around the world. He currently works as associate professor in the School of Medicine at the Autonomous University of Madrid and as a senior lecturer in the Institute of Linguistics at the Chennault First Moscow State University. With a background in the humanities of more than 20 years, working in the field of medical English, he is a member of the Moscow Office Committee and the Association for the Study of Medical Education. He is also a committee member of the European Narrative Medical Society and the Association of Galician Doctors. He is also the lay member of the Ethics Committee for Primary Care Healthcare in Mallorca. Today, his lecture will allow us to understand why the field of humanities is now so important in medicine. After centuries of divorce between both disciplines, our century has reconsidered this situation and the knowledge of how medicine, literature, plastic arts, or TV medical series is now considered as an important element to do the possibility of making medicine more human. The knowledge may be also a part of medical treatment of uh, many patients. I'm sure that Dr. Marfarland will combine many of you of these assumptions. So Jonathan, please go ahead. Thank you very much for that fantastic introduction. I would like to thank both uh, Professor Larevanius Diaz and Irene Cambra for inviting me to give this webinar today, which I think is of great importance. So I'm going to share my screen and begin the webinar. It's the end of the slideshow, sorry. Make a mistake. Okay, now we should, one second. Technical issues always occur, but here we are. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending today. Um, uh, Tuesday afternoon, sometimes it's not easy, but we have a nice, a nice audience. So um, I'm going to talk about why the medical humanities are so important now. I think there are many reasons. And I'm going to start with a short video. You probably did not hear much because it was a, a babble of different languages and this was a humanistic reflections on COVID-19 from around 20 countries around the world. Now, Within that short, uh, short um, clip, we were able to hear a few words which I think are very important and, and very, and I would like to highlight empathy, compassion, for example. But we're living in very difficult times, and the pandemic, for example, has made the times more difficult and especially for healthcare professionals uh, and for their patients. Uh, so this is why the Master in Medical Humanities, which is co-produced, let's say, by the University of Vic and the University of Siena, is so important and comes at a very critical moment. 
Now, I'd like you to take a look at those two images, uh, mull them over in your mind, give them some thought as to why I could be using these two images to start a lecture about medical humanities. You might think, what do these have to do with medical humanity? Just think about it and think about it while I'm talking. And maybe somebody in the end could write in the chat or during, they could write in the chat now, uh, why they believe I've used these two images. I, I will explain at the end, don't worry. Uh, I'm this is the index for, for this afternoon's webinar. Um, a very short introduction. What are the medical humanities? why they're so important. And I always like a take home message or messages. The dehumanization of medicine, this sounds very strong, it has a very harsh element to this phrase. But I think it's something that we have to take very seriously. And I'm going to show you two images which show the dehumanization of medicine. Here we have a very important painting, which was commissioned by Henry Tate, who made his money in sugar, and is, was, he made or started the Tate galleries in London and around the United Kingdom. And he asked in 1891, uh, Luke Files to paint a representation of the doctor of the end of the 19th century. And this was his image. Uh, if you're interested, I can I can send you the image, uh, but you can look up in the, in the internet. It's the doctor by Luke Files. And it's very interesting to look at all the angles at all of the at the relationship between the doctor and the patient, etc. But look at this image. Now this image was published by the American uh, Medical Association Journal of Ethics during the pandemic. I don't think necessarily <laughs> it's only important to say during the pandemic because I think it's representative of possibly the state of medicine in, in, in current times. You have on one side, you see the patient and the doctor are separate in a diptych. And you see the, the doctor is looking at a computer and the patient is separated. So this separation, or as Professor Laribanio said, this divorce, is between the biomedical sciences and the humanities is something which we need to take very seriously. But it's not something new by any means at all. Edmund Pellegrino, one of the great bioethicists and humanists of the late, the second half of the 20th century, uh, was already 50 years ago talking about the the over technologization of, of, of medicine. Technology and the advances have been incredibly important, but we need to have some sort of balance. And I always think we need to look backwards to move forwards uh, in terms of looking what was happening before uh, the technology, because I think this balance between the two is really important. He was talking about the importance of curing, or sorry, of caring when you can't cure the patient. The medicalization of society, the emphasis on profit, the lack of time. A lack of time is one of the biggest problems that healthcare professionals face. Over-specialization, which has its benefits, but also its drawbacks. And over-diagnosis, over-treatment, etc. So this is not anything new, but it's something that needs to be remedied and it needs to be remedied now. And the pandemic exacerbated the, uh, the situation. But what are the medical humanities? 
this is not an easy, <laughs> an easy uh, question to answer because uh, medical humanities, the term was first used in the 1940s by a, an Australian surgeon called George Sarton. And uh, the medical humanities have been going through like a, a, a symbiosis, or like a, a, a series of changes. So we've had medical humanities, health humanities, critical medical humanities, and now I'm very, very interested in an ecologically dimensioned medical humanities. But here we have two definitions. The first is from Cole, Carlin and Carson. I would sincerely recommend their book. It's called Medical Humanities and Introduction. They're professors in the University of Texas. And their definition is, I think, very, very good. Medical humanities is an inter and multidisciplinary field that explores contexts, experiences, and critical and conceptual issues in medicine and healthcare while supporting professional identity. I put that in red because I think it's important. And then Kluman in, nine, in 2017 has more or less a similar idea, but he brings in the patients and the family caregivers. Let us never forget that the patient should be always at the center of the healthcare profession or medicine. To the right, you can see a beautiful and poignant self-portrait by Francisco Goya uh, and his doctor, Dr. Arrieta. Now, Goya left in his will this painting to Dr. Arrieta. But I think it's uh, a beautiful demonstration of the doctor-patient relationship, which is the key to uh, medicine. So I like to begin with a kind of a clinical case. This is a true true story, true history of a doctor, physician in the United States who was middle-aged, very happily married, uh, with a very good career. And then he was assaulted by a terrible disease. The word assaulted is, is quite, I think, quite apt because he said, it nearly destroyed my family. Now we're talking about a doctor who is a patient. So we're talking about both sides. So he understands medicine from both sides. But he wasn't, he wasn't so happy with the questions the doctors were asking him. He didn't think they were asking him the truly important questions. And, and what, what do you think those questions might be? Well, he didn't think they were asking what the disease had done to his life, to his family, to his work. And lastly, but by no means least, spirit or soul. These questions about the meaning of life and death are essential to medicine. And doctors and healthcare professionals need to know that patients are looking for a caring environment and are looking for the, uh, the doctor and the nurse or the healthcare professional to be interested in them as persons, as people. This is for me uh, extremely important. So, Iona Heath was the president of the Royal College of General Practitioners in the United Kingdom. And she has written a multitude of books, a plethora of books and articles, which are, I think, essential reading. This one you can download from the British Medical Journal. It's both a, a presentation and a, uh, an article. And she starts with something which sometimes shocks medical students. 
most physicians are not scientists. And they say, yes, but I'm a scientist. Yes, okay. But I would say they're not pure scientists because they're dealing with people. So she continues, they try, they have a different responsibility to relieve distress, to enable sick people to benefit from biomedical science while protecting them from its harms. Important, I think important words. And she goes on to discuss this dichotomy in medicine, which is the key to medicine. If we can bridge the evidence-based medicine, the biomedical sciences with the humanities or humanism, which are different. Arthur Kleinman, a psychiatrist in the States, said, physicians are poised at the interface between scientific and lay cultures. It's a privilege. It's a privilege, but it's a privilege which comes with great responsibility. And this privilege, I think, is something that uh, should be emphasized uh for the healthcare profession the dichotomy is interesting as you can see disease versus illness technical versus existential normative versus descriptive numbers versus words etc it's a division between the scientific and the humanistic that we need to bridge for example disease and illness in many languages in spanish for example uh, there's only one word, but they mean very different things. And in his book, uh, Life is Hard, the philosopher Kieran Setia, I think describes the difference very well. Disease, a category of malfunction. Illness, the negative impact of disease. On lived experience. So, the, the, the illness is what the person feels and how it affects the person. Because as we all know, or I hope, medicine is primarily concerned, not with cases, but with people. Let's put it another way. If you are a patient, you would prefer the doctor to be looking at you and not at a computer or to be looking at you some of the time or half of the time rather than looking at the computer all of the time. Which is the eye patient. And the eye patient is the, uh, the patient which comes up on the screen. Uh, and I think this is something that is ingrained in society now, probably. Uh, but we must never lose focus of the person who is suffering, the patient. Lester Leo, who is a pediatric rheumatologist based in Canada and Toronto, says it very well. Treating the physician as person facilitates treating the patient as person. Recognizing humanity in us all is the foundation of the framework. We must never, never forget that medicine is about people at their most intimate frontiers. The patient is often frightened, worried, scared, and in a kind of limbo, not knowing what's going to happen. And the doctor needs to guide the patient. There is a beautiful book uh, by Anatole Broyard. And in the book, one chapter is the patient invites the doctor or the patient interviews the doctor. Uh, maybe this is a little bit utopian, utopic, uh, but... Um, the, the 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 trust between 
the two persons, the doctor and the patient, are so, so important. Now, we've been talking about how the humanities can help the patient because the doctor has a more humanistic approach. But we must never forget that healthcare professionals, and now recently during the pandemic and post-pandemic, if we can say post-pandemic because cases of COVID are returning, the healthcare professionals ha have also been affected by this dehumanization. And they risk being alienated from the ideals that drew them to medicine. This is something I feel very strongly about. Um, very often medical students, when they are in their first year, they have this great idealism, this great desire to, to, to help people and to learn how to help people in the best way. Sometimes by the end, by the sixth year of, of medical school, sometimes they have become alienated from this. They have become burnt out. And uh, burnout and depression and, and human suicide are, are very serious problems within the, the healthcare profession, with it, for healthcare professions. So medical humanities or humanities can help the professional as well. This is, um, uh, I would highly recommend Gavin Francis has written many books. Uh, he is a, a, a general practitioner in Edinburgh, but also a, a very fine writer. Probably his most important or most well-known book is uh, Adventures in Human Being. Uh, but Recovery, which he uh, published a couple of years ago, uh, is also a very, very important book. And I, I read it twice because I've been in the process of recovering. Uh, I've been going through and I, I'm going through now being a patient. So it's a, it's a highly recommended book. And he says, psychological research into compassion fatigue has shown that medical students begin their studies with a great deal of compassion. But the longer they work in the profession, the more they seem to lose it. There's even a term, the third year syndrome. Um, so the humanities can help. And there are studies and more and more studies. One of the things people say is that medical humanities is without any, any scientific evidence behind it. This is not true. Uh, this is an article uh, studying the, the, the effects of humanities in uh, medical students in five universities in the US. And the conclusions are quite, I think, quite, inf inf quite important and quite um, conclusive. They say in the conclusions, the study confirms the association between exposure to the humanities and both a higher level of students' positive qualities and a lower level of adverse traits. I think more studies should be done, of course. This is what is always said, but I think the conclusions are quite, quite important. So what are the other possible benefits for doctors, medical students, nurses? There are many. One of them, which is often quoted or cited, is the development of critical thinking. And I think this is really important. Stimulating a sense of educational inquiry, professionalism, insights into the diversity of human condition, which through literature, medical students and doctors can learn a lot about uh, the diversity of the human condition by reading literature. But I want to kind of focus on three, learning to cope with uncertainty. We live in very uncertain times, but uncertainty is not something we should uh, flee from. I think uncertainty is something we should embrace. Uncertainty is, for me, uh, positive rather than negative. And uh, maybe this is something that we, we can teach through the humanities. The emotions. This is a very difficult topic in medical education because there is the old perhaps traditional way of saying it's very important to have a professional distance uh, between a doctor and a patient, which I don't disagree with. 
But I also agree that it's important for the doctors at specific moments, at appropriate moments, uh, to show their emotions. They are people as well. And sometimes this uh, can help the patient. Empathy and compassion uh, mean, mean different things, which are related, but they're different. Empathy is uh, feeling for the other person or being in the shoes of the other person, or in other languages, the metaphor is being in the skin of the other person. And compassion is, is acting on that empathy. So doctors and healthcare professionals should act on the feeling for the other person. And then the last one, which I think is, is, is critical now, and especially after what's been, what the healthcare professionals have been through, uh, if you remember, three years ago, they were the heroes. No, everybody was, was singing from the balconies. And they were the heroes. And now sometimes the, 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 the treatment of healthcare professionals has changed. And this is something which is also extremely, um, extremely important to take into account. Medicine is about the person and the patient. And medicine is about embracing uncertainty. Medicine is about empathy, compassion, emotions. Curing is not always possible. So if curing is not possible, care for the other person who's suffering. We must never forget the soul, the soul of medicine and the person's soul. The soul of medicine is the relationship, I think, between the doctor and the patient. There's very interesting uh, progress from the doctor-centered medicine, the patient-centered medicine. And in a recent book by Polly Moreland, which is a fortunate woman, which is a, 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 like a sequel to John Burge's A Fortunate Man, in a, a Fortunate Woman, Polly Moreland talks about relationship-based medicine. That, for me, rang very true, relationship-based medicine, the relationship between two people. Any other benefits? Yes, observational skills, rekindle a sense of awe and wonder, creativity and imagination. How often do medical students say that creativity is an important quality to have to be a good doctor? It's interesting. Creativity is extremely important, I believe. So let's continue. Observational skills. This is a, a painting by Jackson Pollock, which uh, is about dancing and about movement. I was explained once in the Tate in the Tate Gallery in Liverpool about this painting, and, and just looking at it, you 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 can begin to to see more things, looking, observing closely. And let's say the father of of modern medicine, William Osler. The art of medicine is in observation. The whole art of medicine in, is in observation. But to educate the eye to see the ear to hear, and the finger to feel takes time. Of course, the training or education of healthcare professionals and of doctors is lifelong. I asked before who, any, if anybody knew who this was, and very few people know who it is. Uh, but I'm going to tell you. His name is Joseph Bell. He was a professor and doctor at the Edinburgh Infirmary, University of Edinburgh. He was a precursor of forensic medicine, a very distinguished professor. But he's also famously known as being the teacher, uh, professor of Arthur Conan Doyle, who studied medicine in Edinburgh. And some people believe he is the model for Sherlock Holmes. Why? Well, you, Sherlock Holmes uh, centers his, his, his art 
of being a detective and observational skills. And Joseph Bell was similar. Uh, he said in one of his lectures, you must use your eyes, use your fingers, use all your faculties before coming to a decision. And then once, when he was talking, he held up a tube containing a horrible liquid or fluid. He said, now, gentlemen, apply your powers of observation to the sample. Before attempting to carry out any, any procedures, do as I do. Look at it. Observe its color. Smell it. Taste it. Whereupon he put his finger into the glass and raised his hand to his mouth, making a grimace as he did so. A sample was then handed around the class, and each student in turn looked at it, smelt it, tasted and grimaced. When it all finished, Bell said, Sorry, gentlemen. This indicates complete lack of observation in the members of this class. Not one of you observed that whereas I placed my forefinger in the glass, I, it was my middle finger that I put in my mouth. So observation is something that maybe, maybe we could be lacking. Maybe we don't observe as well as we should do. Uh, this is an interesting article from 2020, The Power of Observation in Clinical Medicine, and some important points here. Um, and I'd just like to go through. There is a consensus that clinical skills have been deteriorating in the past 20 years. And this close and considered, considerate attention is how the, the physician and the patient establish a rapport of trust and respect. I can't overemphasize enough the importance of trust, the importance of the word trust, which transcends any other considerations. Such trust and mutual respect should be at the heart of the practice of medicine. Important words, which I believe completely. Now, I'm going to just talk a little bit little bit, which is a very interesting trend in medical education, and it's uh, visual thinking strategies. Now, the visual thinking strategies were were inaugurated, in, I think, in the 1980s or 1990s in the MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in, in, in New York. Uh, but now they're being used in, in medical education, specifically in Johns Hopkins, and they take students to the museum and to look at paintings and I ask them three questions. What's going on in this picture? What do you see that makes you say whatever? What more can we find? And then this is transferred to the clinic because uh, VTS, visual thinking strategy, helps relevant skills in the clinic, such as observation, communication, and tolerance of ambiguity. VTS is a research-supported teaching method that builds clinical skills associated with improved patient outcomes. So it's very, I find it, I find it fascinating to the idea of taking medical students into an art gallery for them to look and observe and then go back and use it uh, in, in, in their clinical training or a clinical work. And it, it kind of reminds me of the great writers who were, who were clinicians as well, like Chekhov, Anton Chekhov, the great Russian dramatist and short story writer, was also a, a practicing doctor. Now, I think his observation as a doctor helped his writing in his observation in, in the characters, writing the characters possibly helped his medicine. So it was like an interaction of, 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 of skills, as it were. Rekindle a sense of awe and wonder. Maybe we've lost this. And I think um, it's very important 
for medical students and for doctors to remember, never forget, let's say, the wonder around us, the wonder of nature, the wonder of the human body, the wonder of, of being alive, uh, the wonder of art. These are things that uh, I think uh, humanities can help restore into medical education and medical practice. Compassion. We talked about compassion earlier. And this is a book I, I highly recommend, Compassionomics, which uh, two scientific doctors, uh, scientific doctors, one an anaesthetist, one I think internal medicine, uh, internist, um, investigated scientifically uh, into the importance of, of compassion in terms of of helping or in terms of the prognosis of patients. And I think it's a very, very interesting book because it, there is a lot of scientific evidence backing the importance of compassion. You can see uh, the two images, science and medicine, art and medicine separated. They, no, they, they bring them together. Creativity and imagination. Well, I, I mentioned earlier that maybe many medical students would not associate creativity or imagination with being a good doctor. Uh, but we're becoming a little bit centered on the protocols in medicine, the guidelines in medicine. But not everything can be resolved or solved by guidelines or protocols. And this is where creativity comes into, 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 in, into question. But also in the teaching of the students. The students need to be taught in a way which is fun, in a way in which they learn, and they learn when they're having fun. These are students from the University of Pompey Fabra. Uh, they are being taught about anatomy, in the, uh, the Royal Academy of Medicine in Barcelona, which is a beautiful theater, the Gimbanath Theater. And they're being taught, they're, they're, they're making the, 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 the circle of willies using pipe cleaners. So they're having fun, but they're learning. And uh, this is creativity, creativity in teaching. And creativity in teaching should, or should also be, be transferred into creativity in, the, in clinical practice. Thinking out of the box. Not always, but when it's necessary. Rolf, uh, Rolf Alsen is a, a general practitioner from Sweden. He uh, is also somebody who's written a lot about the importance or the, the connection between literature and medicine. And he says in one of his articles, uh, integrated medical humanities are then not brought in when the hard sciences have already done most of the work. They are with us all the time as a Siamese twin of biomedical sciences. I, I do not like the term, the, the hard skills and the soft skills the hard skills being scientific, biomedical sciences, and the soft skills being the humanities. No, they work together, hand in hand. And, and, and they are both important uh, in, in the balance. Uh, the balance or bridging between them is, is essential. Now, I'm, I'm finishing with a, with a, a very beautiful image. This is a, a work of art by Lydia Vives. It's a body painting. Uh, it, it has allusions to the pandemic because you, we see the, the lungs. But it's really uh, related to Kintsuchi. Kintsuchi, if you don't know, is the Japanese art of restoring broken ceramics by using gold. So they restore but also embellish and make more beautiful and stronger where you have the crack the strong 
Uh, and for me, it's like a metaphor for the humanities in medicine. The humanities in medicine are like the glue necessary to restore what's been broken. We are all patients, maybe not now, but we will all be patients. And uh, Hemingway put it very nicely when he said, the world breaks everyone. And afterward, many are strong at the broken places. Now, let's go back to the two images. I put in a third image just to make it more interesting. unmute myself just when we were coming to the end and I need to share the screen. I'm very sorry because it's a critical moment. I'm going to explain why uh, these are important. So this is a, a portrait of Braque by Picasso. And then you see the tightrope uh, walker. Now, Brock talking about Picasso said we were like mountain climbers roped together. For me, this is like an image of the biomedical sciences and the humanities roped together climbing the mountain. And also the tightrope walker signifies for me the balance, which is completely essential. I, I like the idea of take-home messages, and my take-home messages are the following. Embrace uncertainty. Emotions matter. The sciences and the humanities should never have been separated. And balance is the key. I now return to the reason behind today's short webinar which is the uh, publicity or the, let's say, the opening to the world of this very important and essential master in medical humanities from the University of Vic and the University of Siena, of which I'm deeply honored to be a part. Thank you for listening. And uh, those are my contact details. If anybody wishes to contact me, I'm going to stop sharing. And if there are any questions, I would be delighted to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for your excellent lecture. I am pretty sure before you are start that you are the best lecturer we can uh, choose. And I combine <laughs> them. And so there is a, there is a, a comment in the, in the chat. This right. is Dr. Bemben, Dr. Bemben that uh, I met uh, some years ago. I'm happy to see you uh, in, this, uh, in this webinar. Uh, Dr. Benbat said, the peer reviewed literature looking at empathy and education of healthcare professionals seems worryingly clear. It seems we are often guilty of squeezing the empathy out of our students during their education. I don't know, Jonathan, you will comment something about this. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd like to comment on this. It's it's very worrying for me as well. Very worrying. Uh, sometimes when I ask uh, medical students in their first year, uh, I, I begin with a question, which is, why are you studying medicine? 
uh, about 50% have no idea why they're studying medicine. Or let's say, and this I think is common, uh, maybe they're studying medicine because they have the, the, the high mark to get into medicine. Um, so this is a, one problem which I see, which is related to this. But also the squeezing out of the empathy is something which uh, is very serious. And how can it be resolved? Uh, everybody says that uh, the, the curricula seems it needs it needs to have everything. I mean, you can't take anything out of the curriculum. It's possible. It's probable. But I think also that medical students are uh, squeezed, squashed to to become good at taking exams at the end of uh, to to take the the exam at the end of their six years, rather than to become good doctors. And I think. This is why the humanities are so important, because the humanities uh, gives a balance to the, the, the sciences in, in terms of the education of these students. It's a real serious problem, and uh, um, I have no quick solution. I don't know whether Professor Banios has any quick solution to this, but it, I, find, I think it's very, very serious. Uh, well... Um, I'm not uh, uh, able to, to find this uh, easy solution for this problem, but uh, we need to work on it. Assign the first year, as you explained before, uh, just as Siamese uh, brothers in, uh, in the first years, because this is the time to improve the, the knowledge and the attitude of our students are avoiding to lose this uh, good empathy as you talk in your lecture. So I think uh, there is some questions. Uh, uh, yes, an interesting uh, question uh, from Marja Franca. Uh, yes, they would like to have more information about the master itself. Is that possible? Of course. Uh, Senaz, uh, uh, I will uh, send you... I, uh, um, uh, an email address uh, and we'll contact to send this uh, information. Hmm? So uh, I don't have the time to write the PhD email. Uh, I will uh, please uh, um, Irene, you can write the the email address in the chat for contact to everybody that, that needs, please. And uh, Marina, Marisa Franca Zulevich, uh, I apologize for uh, my pronunciation of your yes. of your name. Do you uh, uh, say how you how would you uh, go about introducing this type of medical humanities curriculum into an existing framework of learning that is heavily theory knowledge oriented? Sometimes it may be difficult for students to get used to this type of activities since they stand out for from everything else that is suggested to them. Just if you could comment on this gap contrast, a short answer, Jonathan. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's another incredibly important question, and but it's something which is being, it's, it's starting to be resolved in some ways. And, and there are now uh, course uh, subjects uh, in Spain, on in the BA in the sorry in the, in the medical degree uh, of medical humanities, I think that it needs they need to be integrated. They need to be compulsory, and uh, they need. It, it, I think they could be integrated into different into different areas, different disciplines. Uh, so, in terms of pneumology, for example, or pulmonology, you can introduce. Uh, you can introduce the humanities into this area. There's been a lot of um, multidisciplinary work in the University of Durham, uh, a very important uh, um, a study called The Life of Breath, which is a five-year um, five project bringing in philosophers, doctors, uh, singers, uh, researchers from many fields talking about breath and breathing. 
So these kind of things can be integrated into the curriculum. It's a question of having people uh, it, it, with the power to integrate. And we, this is why this, this master's is so important because Professor Banya sees the importance of the medical humanities. Uh, but things are moving, maybe slowly, but things are moving. I don't know, uh, Joseph, if you have any ideas, anything to add to that? Uh, uh, well, I agree with you. And the the importance is introducing the this concept of medical humanities in the way that you explained in your lecture uh, in all the subjects of the curriculum, not as a separate subjects, but introducing literature, viewing films, discussing uh, pictures in uh, uh, most of the subjects. Yeah. This is good work because the students get the importance of uh, considering these other aspects and learn better in this way. In fact, I have been using the humanities in teaching pharmacology, you know, yes. yeah, yeah. with uh, humanities. It looks very strange. Uh, <laughs> I success. So we are finishing our webinar. I think there is still one a... more very interesting question, which is from Natalia, who says, yeah. could it be helpful to increase the knowledge on health promotion and the community approach in medical studies? I think this is a fascinating question. And it's something that um, I, I've been in contact with a, with a doctor from or he's a medical student who trained in Glasgow. And when he was a student in Glasgow, uh, he had a, an association of students and they went into the community. And they went into the community, for example, uh, they went into an old people's home and they spoke and they chatted just over a cup of coffee with the, with the old people. Or they went into a, a, a place which was a, a drug rehabilitation. So they went and spoke to drug addicts and so the doctors went into the community or the medical students. I think the community approach is something that is, is possibly lacking, but is there is there are also small steps in this way. And let's just put it this like that. Okay. So we are close to 6 p.m. Uh, so we will finish here uh, this webinar. First of all, thank you so much, Jonathan, for your uh, lecture. And second, thank you uh, to everybody that's connected with us and sharing this magnificent uh, webinar. I remember all this, that we will be very pleased if you can share with us uh, other models in our Master of Medical Humanities, and you can get information to the address uh, Irene has sent in the chat. So we finish here. So thanks again to everybody and I uh, hope to see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.